This thing works. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Senate Committee on Judiciary. Madam Secretary, would you please call the roll? Senator Harris? Here. Senator Orenshaw? Here. Senator Don Darrell Loop? Here. Senator Wynn? Here. Senator Hansen? Senator Krasner? Here. Senator Stone? Here. Chair Scheibel? Chair Scheibel, uh, please mark excused for the day. Uh, we have one bill on the agenda at Senate Bill 243, which revises provisions relating to catalytic converters. Um, I will invite our colleague, Senator Wynn, to the table to present the bill. Uh, Senator Wynn, go ahead and begin whenever you are ready. Committee members, for your information, there is a amendment at your desk um, proposed by the Nevada District Attorneys Association. Uh, it's my understanding that Senator Wynn will be presenting that version of the bill. So um, if you don't have that, please just let me know. Uh, for everyone in the crowd and watching, it should be available up on Nellis as an exhibit for today's meeting. Senator Wynn. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Harris and fellow Judiciary Committee members. My name is Rochelle Wynn, and I'm pleased to come before you today to present Senate Bill 243. Um, Senate Bill 243 is intended to help curb what has increasingly become a serious and expensive problem, catalytic converter theft. Um, before I go over some of the background, I'd just like to offer you some brief, like, national context, and I have um, Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department Detective Christopher Reese here also to provide some information about some of our more local communities. Um, but I'll get into some of the national data. Um, According to Carfax, last year in the United States, there were as many as 153,000 catalytic converters stolen. The parts being stolen were, were because they contain rare metals that are used in whole, a whole host of products. These metals are very expensive to produce and are in short supply, which means making stealing catalytic converters pretty lucrative. Catalytic converters are relatively easy to steal as they are exposed under a vehicle and can be removed quickly. For those who haven't Googled what a catalytic converter is on your car, um, I would suggest that you do that. Um, I was talking to um, the detective earlier today about how long it takes to do it, and sometimes people are able to remove these in less than a minute and a half. Um, and even with a guard piece um, that was is used sometimes to prevent this type of theft, it still only adds maybe a couple of minutes to that theft. Um, State Farm, the largest automobile insurer in the country, reported that between July 2021 and June of 2022, catalytic converter thefts rose nationally by 109%. And since 2019, that number is over 400%, which impacts not only those who are the direct victims of these thefts, but anyone who owns a car and has to pay for auto insurance. Um, I always like to give my origin story on all my bills. So this started by me reading a neighborhood, a McNeil neighborhood, that's the neighborhood I live in, in Southern Nevada. And on the Facebook page about a couple years ago, there was a report of whether or not there was a catalytic converter theft. I didn't even know what that was really until that moment. And when I went to look it up and see what it was that was being stolen and people were told, put your cars in your garage so um, your catalytic converters aren't stolen. In my neighborhood, that's not always possible, and throughout Senate District 3, that's not all, at all possible. In fact, I don't even have a garage to put a vehicle in. So there are a lot of thefts that take place in neighborhoods that don't have gated communities and don't have garages. But as I looked into this, um, I had a meeting with um, Chris, who's sitting next to me here today at Bungalow Coffee to talk about all things that were happening in my district and what Metro was doing and what they were working on. And this was about a year ago. Is that about right? About a year ago. And we were meeting at Bungalow Coffee and he brought this to my attention. So that is why I forced him to come here and help me present this bill today because I think it's always important to like give credit to those that are trying to come up with solutions that uh, affect all of us in our community and throughout our state. Um, I also love how this drafting and the support of this bill came to be kind together because 
kind of highlights what I like to do when I'm working on all of my bills. I like to see that they come from the community and I like to see that kind of participation. You will see probably in the support testimony, there's a lot of city jurisdictions that are here. There are a lot of business owners that are here. And I know that I'm lucky to have great local representatives that I work with and I work collaboratively with them and openly and we share like constituency bases. And so we always try to come together to solve problems. So I remember I reached out to my neighbor and my friend and my also my Clark County Commissioner, Tick Segerbloom, and I remember we would talk about how many people in our neighborhood had their catalytic converters so stolen. He was working on the county and seeing if there were things that they could do with county ordinances in order to curb this theft, prevent this theft, because we knew it was a huge problem. I also reached out to my city councilman and mayor pro tem, Brian Knudsen, um, because we had worked together on trying to find out solutions, not only for our community, our city, but also that could be applied statewide. And I knew he was seeing these problems and hearing from his constituents, our shared constituents, about catalytic converter theft. I know when I reached out to Metro and I asked what the statistics were, and we'll hear some of those statistics, I knew in Las Vegas City Council Ward 1, which I live in, it of the six wards in the city of Las Vegas, Ward 1 had the, the most number of catalytic converters stolen within um, all six districts. And a lot of it has to do, like I said, with the lack of garages, the lack of open space, um, and it would being so easy. In fact, between 2020 and 2021, in Ward 1, there were 490. So I knew in talking with my county commissioner and my city councilman that they were trying to come up with solutions locally and that this was a problem that was affecting anyone really with a parking lot. So you will hear from a lot of people testifying about that. Um, I Before I go into um, uh, the bill summary, I'm going to first turn this next over to Detective Reese to kind of give his statement. Good afternoon, Vice Chair Harris and the Senate Committee on Judiciary. My name is Chris Reese, R-I-E-S, and I proudly represent the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. First, I would like to say, uh, thank Senator Wynn for this opportunity to present alongside of her, uh, and as well as sponsoring this, um, what we feel is important legislation. In 2022, there were over 2,500 reported thefts involving catalytic converters in our jurisdiction. To be sure, this is only the reported thefts. There may be many more where the victim goes outside, realizes their catalytic converter is stolen, and just repairs it themselves. We've seen an increase in recent years of this theft, from 2019 to 2022, catalytic, converters, catalytic converter thefts have increased over 1,200%. Like Senator Wynn said in experience, a uh, catalytic converter thief can remove a, a converter within minutes with equipment easily found at the local hardware store. The cost to the victim of this crime could be thousands of dollars, not to mention the time, energy, and stress that it also causes. Nearly ev every one of your constituents has either been affected by catalytic converter theft or knows someone who has. Nonprofits, organizations, rental car companies, yes, law enforcement agencies, and even the beloved Oscar Mayer Wienermobile have been victims of the crime. Currently, stealing catalytic converters is difficult to prosecute individuals for several reasons. Many of our arrests are from individuals caught in the act of stealing or attempting to steal a catalytic converter. However, if that person was not seen stealing the catalytic converter and was just observed with the converter in their possession, the likelihood of bringing that person to justice is minimal. The main reason is that the, that the, main reason is that the catalytic converter is typically not serialized or, and does not have the VIN number applied by the manufacturer. Therefore, it cannot be easily traced back to the victim's vehicle. For example, if a patrol officer stops a person with five catalytic converters, Experience tells us that that person stole those catalytic converters. However, the, op the officer typically cannot arrest on the thefts and would, would arrest for possession of burglary tools or injury or tamper with a vehicle. This law will allow us to arrest on both the theft of the stolen catalytic converter and or the possession of those catalytic converters. Even more, this will allow us to better track the theft or possession of catalytic converters. Without any changes to the statutes, we can expect to see the continued rise in thefts of these. Thank you. Rochelle Wynn, for the record. Um, just to kind of go through a, a 
section by section, kind of high level overview. I know that this committee um, prepares incredibly for these hearings and this is the only one on here today. But to kind of start with section two, um, it kind of, it starts by defining catalytic converter theft and creates this rebuttable presumption for someone who's in possession of two or more of these used catalytic converters. Um, and who is also not a properly licensed in a business that regularly deals with catalytic converters. As you heard Detective Reese talk about earlier, um, I, I showed I showed an officer a one time a picture that showed up on one of our colleagues um, like neighborhood like next door pages, and it was a person who had a shopping cart and it was full of catalytic converters and they were just walking down the road casually like it was groceries, and so I said, what could you do in that situation if you caught someone? with uh, a shopping cart full of catalytic converters. And I was told the best that we could probably do, since we have no way of knowing which cars those catalytic converters came from, and without any kind of other like supporting document, probably possession of stolen property for the shopping cart, um, and not for the catalytic converters that were clearly um, any indication might give rise to them being in there. There are some exceptions within that um, that because this is kind of a unique situation where you don't have to show intent and it's just the mere possession of these catalytic converters, that's why we um, ended up with having possession of two of them. Um, and even then, there is a rebuttable presumption. If you are in a desperate situation where you want to get the you know, platinum that is in your catalytic converter and you wanna cut it off of your vehicle and you have one of those and you want to take it in and try to get some money for it, you still have to show that chain of custody essentially when you bring it over to wherever you're going to sell it. So there are some affirmative defenses that are built into that like crime itself because it is just a crime of possession. Um, section three goes into uh, goes on to prohibit the purchase of a used catalytic converter from anyone other than a properly licensed business or person who can prove that ownership of that converter. It kind of goes back to um, there are some ways to do this. Section four, and if you'll see, if we refer to the district attorneys associations like amended. Uh, amendment that is proposed. That is what I'm going off here. It sets out penalties associated with illegal theft um, of these possession and possession and sale of these catalytic converters, and they range anywhere from category E felonies to category B felonies. You'll see that there were some changes made in the amendment, and that came um, kind of, you know, we don't want to make a law that can't be, that doesn't work. Um, we don't want to make a law that is difficult for officers in the field to be able to make those arrests. And we also want to make sure that our prosecutors can like effectively prosecute those crimes. And so a lot of these amendments just brought clarity to that. We had some um, an original language that made maybe too many categories and too many different types of things when it could be said more plainly. And that's what we're hoping to accomplish, something that is written efficiently and effectively to allow for that law enforcement to do their job and the prosecutors to enforce those laws as well. Um, section six and seven carry over some definitions of uh, permanently marked and used catalytic converters for the purposes of implementing the bill. Section eight um, sets forth provisions governing which entities, property licensed businesses are allowed to purchase cat use catalytic converters from. And these provisions mirror those that I've already discussed in relation to who can legally possess. And the people that can legally possess are kind of set out there in that section two, um, A through, E. Um, and section nine requires um, one of the things we also wanted to look at and is not only um, making this crime that is already occurring something that is prosecutable, like you can prosecute for, but we also wanted to take a look at the people that were purchasing these. While there are many good players in this, um, you know, in this realm of recyclers or junkyards or any of those kind of industry, 
people are stealing these because there's obviously a place for them to sell them. And the, once you cut these catalytic converters, it's not like you can put them on another car. You have to, you're, you can't just take a used one and stick it on another car. You actually have to get a new one. And so the only purpose of these used catalytic converters is to take out those precious metals. So we wanted to make sure that there was some transparency on the processors and the scrap metal processors that are purchasing these used catalytic converters um, just so we can track them, kind of like we do with copper theft or we do at a pawn shop. That just gives um, a little bit more opportunity to find out where these stolen items are going to. Section 14 of the bill adds used catalytic converters to the list of scrap metals that law enforcement may require information to be gathered by scrap metal processors. And this information, again, largely mirrors that that is required in Section 10. Um, statistics on catalytic converter theft will also be now added to the report um, from law enforcement that are submitted to the Legislative Council Bureau so we can gauge the effectiveness of this legislation to see if it is helping improve our communities. Chair Harris, that about covers the provisions of the bill, kind of a high-level overview, and with your permission, I would uh, open this up to questions. Committee members, do we have questions? Senator Hansen. Senator Dondera Loop, and then we'll circle back to you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Vice Chair. Um, I sort of remember when we did scrap metal, and so, and I see the metal, um, the scrap metal people referenced in here. What, when we did scrap metal, we did that because it was the copper and what have you was being sold, right? Mm -hmm. And there was no identifying marks on that. So why is it that this didn't fall under some of those um, NRS or laws? We, we attempted to emulate that in this new section because it wasn't included and it wasn't a part of that. So um, you'll look at this and it kind of emulates what we saw in that copper with the copper theft because it is very similar. We don't have the ability, you know, it, it was like it was before. If you saw someone with a shopping cart full of, you know, copper wiring, there was no way to you know tie that to i can say that there is you know potential federal legislation and i think that would be appropriate um, when it comes to catalytic converters about branding that i know that our local jurisdictions have like um, programs that are voluntary um, where you can come and get your like vin number heat stamped onto your catalytic converter to help like you know tie that device to the car that it was stolen from so but we're in a similar situation and that's why this emulates that Thank you very much. And follow up, Madam Vice Chair. Um, so with that being said, um, what do we think the, um, and this, I get that this may be a guesstimate for Mr. Reese, but mm -hmm. what, what do we think the um, outcome is? In other words, when we did, when we did copper wire, like how much did it stop? And if we do this, I, you know, I, this just boggles my mind that somebody crawls under a car and steals these things. I mean, it is really weird to me, but I guess there's a big payback for it, right? Because they're going to the scrap metal guys. So, and I'm not throwing them under the bus. I just mean if, so nobody's buying this stuff. Eventually, it doesn't pay to steal it. I guess that's where I'm going with it. So when we did this with, say, copper wiring, did it stop some of that theft? I mean, where's, we've got to have a stop gap where they can't make money on it. I mean, it's a used piece of a vehicle, so it's not like you're selling new stuff. Thank you, Senator, for the question. Chris Reese, for the record, R-I-E-S. Um, our hope is that it decreases the, the theft of catalytic converters you know, a lot. Um, you're correct in that the same issues with the copper come into play with the catalytic converters because you, um, you can't trace it back to the vehicles. Uh, with this bill, um, it will allow us to arrest these people for the possession, whereas before, uh, like Senator Wynn was saying, the, the worst we could do was the possession of the shopping cart. Um, I don't know how many would be less. Uh, hopefully, you know, all of them would be uh, not stolen. 
And just to give you some perspective, when I was reaching out to people on, you know, um, and you might have some other statistics, but I've heard anywhere people are getting anywhere from five to seven hundred and fifty dollars for each one of these catalytic converters um, when they are selling them, you know, on whether it's a black market, which I think happens a lot. I think it happens and it leaves the other states. So we are fortunate because even our surrounding states have started to implement um, catalytic converter theft and reporting similar to this um, um, be in response to this. Um, but it's not even the amount that they are. It's the amount that it's out to the consumer. I think you heard a, a lot of times it is our like older vehicles. And so this crime is really preying on people with like less expensive vehicles to do it and sometimes it can cost around $2,500 to replace that catalytic converter. And I truly believe that of the 2,400 reported catalytic converter thefts, I know of so many more people that have had their catalytic converter stolen that just didn't report it. Um, we also had a supply chain shortage because of the precious metals that are in those catalytic converters. So sometimes people were waiting a long time. I even like visited um, a YMCA in the district, my district, and they were um, had $75,000 worth of catalytic converters stolen from their buses to the point where they were parking their buses in their gymnasium or at the fire station across the street to avoid like having them stolen. Um, you know, not to embarrass Metro, but I think they've had a couple catalytic converters stolen from police cars. So it is so easy to steal these um, that putting in some of these protections, I think, will be crucial. Thank you very much. It just, like I said, it just blows my mind. Like, who's sitting in the wherever said, let's go steal catalytic converters? It's just so crazy. And you're right, it's really about the consumer. But if the guy or woman stealing the catalytic converter doesn't have anywhere to take it, doesn't get the return on it, then it starts starts to wane, and of course they may find something else to steal. I don't know, but but it starts to wane, and you know we cannot have the Wiener Mobile out of service. So nor can we have Metro. So all right, thank you, Senator Hansen. Uh, thanks, Madam Vice Chair. Um, I like the bill. Completely, you know, I talked to Senator Wynn, uh, you know, my brother has a roofing company. Some guy hopped over their fence, stole five catalytic converters out of their five roofing trucks. Uh, it was part of a ring. It turns out it, they, there was a, I think they went to Southern Cal and sold them or something. But I, the question I got in this, and, and as far as the copper stuff too, I've been selling scrap copper for my plumbing business for over 30 years. And I've watched the evolution of, when I go in there now, I got to get a fingerprint. They take a picture of me. I got to give them my driver's license. Um, you know, so they're, they've cracked down on that, at least with the legitimate dealers. The concern I've got with this is, is, is uh, Section 10, I think, it, which one was it where you said they can't, they have to mail them a check. Now remember, there's a lot of, a lot of people that are scrap collectors that frankly are marginal people as far as, you know, being able to make a living. They're not stealing them necessarily. Um, and in some cases, I don't know if they even have a, a resident address you could mail a check to. You know, I mean, having been to scrapyards, I've, I've watched that. Some kind of that, that, that kind of, I, I think that's almost going a little too far to where you have to m force the scrap metal dealers to mail a check. You know, because right now the way they've got it set up, if it's uh, more than like $300, less than that, they'll give you cash. More than that, they give you a check, but then you can't cash the check for a 24-hour window or something. So anyway, I, I, I was just, that's one concern I've got for the legitimate people. Because, well, yeah, there are some bad actors, obviously. There are also some people that are legitimately, you know, selling um, um, catalytic converters. And I don't want to see people who are, um, like I said, I, I don't know how, to, how do you put it politely? They're the people that are homeless in so many cases and people that are, you know, digging through dumpsters and stuff, finding aluminum cans and stuff and I don't want to see those people um, necessarily punished for not because they're not thieves they're they're people struggling financially like we we leave scrap metal out in our alley where my plumbing business is for those kind of folks they take our old, use water heaters and stuff so anyway I just want to make sure that, that, that when we do this we don't overly burden the scrap metal dealers and also we don't make it so onerous that somebody who has a legitimate attempt at selling a, a catalytic converter is in effect denied that opportunity because he doesn't have a resident you can mail a check to. 
Thank you. Rochelle Wynn, for the record. Um, I, I think this is different than some of those other scrap metal products. Um, Honestly, I, I don't know what a legitimate reason you would have to have a uh, catalytic converter. I've been working with Warren Hardy, and with the vice chair's permission, if I can have him come up, because I know he has worked pretty extensively with me in crafting this legislation on behalf of the scrap uh, metal industry. So he might be able to answer some of those questions as well that uh, Senator Dondero Loop asked, as well as the one that you asked. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Warren Hardy on this issue representing SA Recycling. So I, I do appreciate both Senator Dondera Loop and Senator Hansen's questions on behalf of the industry. But here's what I'll tell you. I am unaware of any reputable scrap metal uh, uh, organization that will buy a catalytic converter. It is a zero tolerance from our company. If you accept a catalytic converter for in our company, you will be fired. Um, the challenge that we have, so, and, and I totally agree, and I've made this argument many times, that Senator Don Darrell Loop brought up is if you if you cut if you cut off the the benefit of it if you cut off the payday it'll stop. The reason it hasn't stopped in Nevada and the reason we have to do what Senator Wynn is is suggesting is these are not being sold in Nevada. They're being sold into California, where surprisingly the laws and rules are lax. We will not stop it in Nevada until law enforcement can do their job effectively to prevent and to arrest the people that are doing this. Again, my guys will not buy them. I'm unaware of anybody that will buy them. Now, here's how it, in fact, early on I advocated that we put in the legislation a strict prohibition against my companies from being able to buy or sell them. We also don't sell them. So we do get access to these through wrecked, wrecked cars. We'll buy a car at an auction that's been totaled for pick apart purposes. I also represent Nevada pick apart or just for the scrap metal value. We cut the catalytic converters off because they have an additional value, but we send them and sell them to a reputable company, a recycling company. And in, in, incidentally, they only buy from other uh, licensed individuals as well. Um, so that's the way it works in the industry. Um, I am unaware there's really no legitimate reason why somebody should possess. I respect Senator Wynn's desire to make sure that one, that one, because okay, there are people that will replace these on the, their own in their garage and they should have an ability to sell them. In Nevada, I don't know where they'll go to sell them. So uh, there really isn't a rep. I and mean, we do, I have seen pictures, you know, we buy catalytic converters because uh, currently you can buy them going through the, the, the uh, Madam Vice Chair, going through the, uh, the process that was outlined by Senator Hansen. Um, that's why the additional response requirements are so valuable and important in this legislation. So on behalf of my client, which is one of the largest recyclers in the United States, we fully wholeheartedly support this legislation as written and I do not believe it's an issue for the scrap metal people or our customers. Okay, well, I didn't realize there was no market for them. I, you know, if I was uh, going to haul an old car off to your scrap metal or your uh, auto place, wrecking, wrecking yard, and I knew my car had a, a catalytic converter and it's worth 500 bucks, uh, I'm going to spend 15 minutes with a grinder, zip, zip, and pop that baby out of there. Two minutes. Two minutes, if you're really good at it. What, are, you, are your clients to do this regularly? Is that what you're saying? You can do it in two, it takes me five. But anyway... <laughs> And Madam Chair, uh, Madam Vice Chair, we will buy that car from you it, with a catalytic converter on it. We will we will buy it without a catalytic converter. We will not buy the catalytic converter. Okay. There, well, I didn't federal, realize there was no market for it. There are it. federal considerations as well. And so there's really no value for us to get them to sell them as used. There are federal laws that require in order to sell a used catalytic converter, it has to be certified. The cost of certification is too great to have any economic value. We just do not deal in catalytic converters. We stay as far away from as we can. Now, I'm not saying there's not bad um, people out there's not people out there that do take them under the current law, which is why this additional requirement on proving ownership is so important. Uh, because there are folks that will take them. I'm just not aware of a reputable company that, that will even touch a catalytic converter. Okay, but that, you know, that, that raises a little bit of an ethical dilemma. Are the ones that, it's not against the law, but they're ones that are not legitimate by your standards or ethical, but there are some that will we'll buy. I'm just kind of like, look, what I don't want to do is overburden people who are just have legitimate catalytic converters off of some junk car they had in their yard or whatever, and then actually make it so they can't sell them for 500 bucks. 
Um, and to be and to be clear, Madam Vice Chair, it's not illegal to buy them. So I wouldn't call them unethical. It is legal to currently buy them. You have to go through the same process for any other scrap metal. I'm just saying most reputable companies make a business decision not to do it because of the the, the liability it potentially. So it's, I, I wouldn't certainly wouldn't call them unethical unethical it's scrap metal so they can buy them they have to go through the process these additional requirements i think are very important to to really stopping the theft so and rochelle Flynn, for the record well i i appreciate it and i know that me and um mr hardy have uh, gotten into this because he wants he's comfortable with his clients having that full like abolition of like being able to sell or buy like ca use catalytic converters I, I i'm i'm very much aware that i didn't want to eliminate this because i know there are people that are doing it and they are doing it lawfully and i think even under these circumstances they would still be able to continue to purchase the as a scenario where you you had mentioned you know if you wanted to cut it off of your vehicle you could go cut it off your vehicle there are certain things that you have to do like provide your license the vin number that the vehicle it, that the catalytic converter came from and so if that like scrapyard uh, or recycling center or junkyard wants to purchase it from you they would still be able to do that but there are now guardrails in there to kind of prevent um, people from doing it. Um, this was also brought to my attention by some people that were up in Reno at the parole and probation office and across the street there was a big vinyl sign at one of the recycling centers that said we buy catalytic converters. So there are clearly people <laughs> that are still doing this and so um, you know that's my intention is I understand wanting it to be um, something that is allows for those sales and that's you know reflected our my policy decision is reflected not only in not making it one catalytic converter makes it a felony possession of one catalytic converter two does um, but one potentially is if you're caught in the act of doing it but just merely possessing it and that's because i didn't want it to be overly burdensome but i did want to make it a little bit burdensome because it's such a unique kind of theft I got it. You're trying to get a balance there. So thank you, uh, Madam Vice Chair. And Madam, Madam Vice Chair Warren Hardy, for the record, uh, we just fully support Senator Wynn in that. We understand the reason for that. We totally get it. And uh, we think it's appropriate. We think it's a very good bill. We'll get to support testimony, Mr. Hardy. <laughs> Senator Stone. Thank you, Chair. And thank you, Senator Wynn, for bringing this forward. I own a number of um, income properties that are in areas that have uh, control gate access. And uh, we probably had four or five of these thefts. Uh, these are modest income people. Uh, I've even had a, a, a tenant that uh, actually saw somebody get underneath a car and within 60 seconds, they were able to take that uh, catalytic converter and go away. Um, I can understand if, if somebody's, you know, got a fender from a 1946 car that might be worth some money they take it in uh, or uh, an engine part that uh, may have some metals associated with it but coming into a, uh, a recycler with a um, catalytic converter has got to be a, a red flag T to me it is I mean there's no other reason why you you would have one obviously if you have a uh, a catalytic converter that's gone defective, you take it to a dealership, they're gonna order it, they're gonna take that one away and they're gonna dispose of it in a way that they think is appropriate. But to highlight why uh, we see such um, thievery of these items, the, the metals that are in them that are precious include platinum. The average in a catalytic converter is a quarter of an ounce that has a street value at $1,000 an ounce of 250 bucks. Palladium, there's an average of a quarter of an ounce. The spot price on palladium today is $1,426. That makes $350 you add to that. Is there a question, Senator Stone? It's coming. And rhodium is an eighth of an ounce at a spot price of $8,400. That brings in the total value of just those precious metals alone sixteen hundred and fifty dollars so what are, what are you finding uh in in the marketplace that these catalytic converters are being sold for i think i heard the term seven hundred and fifty dollars it still leaves a large delta for somebody to to make if you are a um a dismantler or a recycler that uh, uh nefariously will, will look at the value that they can make understanding that these are coming from probably fraudulent ca uh, causes. 
Um, what are you seeing in the marketplace that these are going for? And has there been any actions, and this might be to our Metropolitan Police Department, have there been any recyclers in, um, in Clark County that have been cited for accepting catalytic converters that uh, were nefariously uh, acquired? Rochelle Lynn, for the record, I, you know, th those are some of the numbers. Um, you know, um, you know, Warren Hardy had indicated that his clients don't buy them at all. Um, but I've heard anywhere between five and seven hundred and fifty dollars. Obviously, the people that are purchasing them obviously are getting a mark. <laughs> they're 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 profiting pretty well from that sale. Um, but you might know more information about the other question. In ter uh, Chris Reese, for the record, in terms of the citations for the scrapyards, I'm not aware of any. I'll uh, I'll ask our um, special investigations and uh, and get back with you. Okay, but but. but but I think the problem is is right now it's not a crime for them right. to be able to purchase them. So they're not committed. I, I want to make it very clear. Oh, sorry, Rochelle Wynn for the record. I, I want to make it very clear that, you know, under the current lack of this law, they're able to do that. And they're able to accept that person with a shopping cart full of catalytic converters. If that person comes in and says, no, I didn't steal them, then right. there we go. Right. <laughs> No, no, I, I support the, the intent of the bill. And another problem that we haven't discussed today, which really doesn't have a lot to do with the bill, but has a lot to do with getting these people back in their cars, is that uh, we've had material shortages. Car company, car manufacturers don't order, you know, 20% more catalytic converters than they manufacture cars because they don't expect people to be stealing catalytic converters. So I've had uh, tenants that have had trouble even replacing those catalytic converters, which means they can't drive their cars to and from work, which has an economic effect on these families as well. So thank you for bringing it forward. I appreciate you. Additional questions? Okay, I have a couple if that's all right. Um, is the only way to remove a catalytic converter by cutting it out? Chris Reese, for the record, I believe that is accurate. I'm not uh, the, the best car guy to, uh, to ask that question. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. That's the most efficient way to get them out, but if you're trying to save it, preserve it, know that you can take it out with a wrench and it's designed, uh, catalytic converters are designed to be replaced because they do have a, a, a expiration. So if I went to my dealership and had them replace my catalytic converter, they likely would not saw it off. They would be able to use a wrench and take it off. Madam Vice Chair Warren Hardy, that's correct. They will do it. They, and now I, I don't know on later models whether or not they replace the entire exhaust system, but dealers most likely will not saw them off. That creates additional problems. And Rochelle Wynn, for the record, I believe Mr. McKay is in the um, audience, and he might be able to answer that question as well. Um, in this bill, is there any distinction between being in possession of a catalytic converter that is, in fact, in full tact versus ones that are sawed off? Because it seems to me, from what I'm hearing, the sawed-off ones might be more of an indication that there is something nefarious going on versus having three fully intact ones. Rochelle Wynn, for the record, if you look at the amended language, and it was included in the original language, so section two, subsection three, subsection B, use catalytic converter, has a meaning ascribed to it in section seven of this act. So we actually define this differently than like a brand new product. So I'm looking at the definition in Section 7, and it means a catalytic converter that has been previously installed on a vehicle and has been removed. I don't think that that would put any distinction between one that was removed, let's say, intact by a dealer or by a mechanic who is, you know, potentially replacing one versus one that's sawed off and looks like it was removed hastily. Rochelle Wynn, for the record, we could put greater clarification in there. Um, I think the other provisions of who can be in possession of any kind of catalytic converter might uh, alleviate some of that. So a dealer would have, if they, you know, I, if you're suggesting like if someone took off their catalytic converter on their own vehicle um, and they had 
used not a saw to saw it off and they had it in their possession. I still think that their defense, their affirmative defense would be um, listed in subsection E, a person possessing documentation that proves that the person is the lawful owner of that used catalytic converter without limitation, a certificate of title, registration, um, that would identify it. So I think it would be very easy for you to show that you had lawful possession of that catalytic converter if it was intact and it was used. And Madam Chair, Vice Chair, if I might, uh, Warren Hardy, um, putting that, I see where you're going with that, and it makes a great deal of sense to me, but on later, uh, earlier model vehicles, it, it would probably take the time to steal it down from a minute and a half to four minutes, because somebody with a good, uh, they'd replace their Sawzall with, a, with just an electric, or a, a, a wireless wrench and be able to get it off. There's, you, on the old, on the early models, there were like three bolts on each side. You just pull them off, and you're out. So, it, I see where you're going with that, but I do think it would create a loophole that it would just take a little longer to steal them, but not a lot longer. Well, now you're talking four times as long. I went to UNLV, Madam Chair. So, <laughs> don't, don't, don't get me started. So did I, which is why I was able to do it so quickly. Yes. Okay. Um, Thank you for um, pointing to Section E because that's where my next questions are going to come from. If these catalytic converters don't currently have VINs on them, how do we expect someone who's in possession to prove that, you know, that this catalytic converter does in fact match a vehicle that they own? I, I think because we have the registry system as well, um, so I'll tell you, in my day job, I never see these kind of crimes. I know that Senator Hansen had mentioned, you see this all the time. I don't see this all the time. In fact, I hear about it all the time in my neighborhoods, and I know people are having their catalytic converter theft. But in my job as a defense attorney, even representing indigent-like individuals, I have never seen one of these cases. I've never had to defend against one of these cases. And when I talk to... Um, people that were prosecuting this are like, we just don't see them because we can't do it. And when I talk to like police officers, they're like, we can't do anything about it. So that that's where that kind of came in. And so having some of those defenses, I think that is something that would be an affirmative defense is you would be able to do it. If I had a client came up to me and said, I have possession of this and how do I prove this? You know, I would be able to go to my car, take a picture of where I took it off of, show you what my VIN number was on my car. When you look at the requirements, if you went to like one of these places and you were looking to sell this catalytic converter, you would be able to, you have to provide information about the vehicle that it came from. And so you wouldn't be able to come in with the same VIN number that you have on one car and say that all the catalytic converters, and it would give um, you know, law enforcement, a resource to be able to go and say, hey, there looks like there were like 14 catalytic converters all associated with this same VIN number. And so I think there are um, ability to defend against the innocent possession, I guess, of a catalytic converter. But my concern, I think, arises from the fact that it says, uh, starting on line 24 at the top, Line, uh, line 24 at the top of page 2 on the Nevada District Attorney Association's version, it says, from which the used catalytic converter was removed and which includes a vehicle identification number that matches the vehicle identification number permanently marked on the used catalytic converter. But I'm also hearing that catalytic converters do not have VINs marked on them. And so my concern is I'm facing a felony and I'm trying to prove something that I can't that I that I can't prove I mean my three cars may be missing a catalytic converter but I can't match the catalytic converter to my three cars and I think I'd have to do that after I've been handcuffed and facing a, a court date hopefully a bail hearing within 48 hours um, but you know I've got a felony that I'm that I'm facing here and I, I don't know if I just, I don't know how they prove that. I mean, theoretically, if all catalytic converters had VIN numbers, it'd be less of a problem, but I'm hearing that they don't. 
And I, I think we, our intention, and I, I'm happy to go back and, you know, I see this as a working document, and I think that's why I appreciate having committee hearings where we can actually have these kind of conversations because we don't always get it right the first time. Um, and obviously this is the second time, and if we're being honest, this is probably like the 10th version of this. So um, I, I think our intention was a person possessing documentation that proves the person is in lawful uh, owner of the used catalog, including without limitation. And so this is, I think, giving examples of things that there are, because there are programs, like I know Washoe has a program um, through their sheriff's office where you can have your VIN number heat stamped onto your catalytic converter if you want. Um, and I think there are similar programs down south, and there are other places that are doing that. Um, hopefully we'll have some legislation that comes from our federal government that requires this on all vehicles. I know that there's some pending legislation that was introduced by with some bipartisan support by Senator Klobuchar, I believe, um, that like has some of those requirements, but we don't have those right now. So you're right, there are not. But I, I read that as to these are some examples without limitation to include these kind of like documentation. Um, and but I would be happy to work with that like particular definition to give it more clarity, so you don't have the innocent possession that is now a felony, and they aren't able to prove that otherwise. Uh, Chris Reese, for the record. Senator, I, I also believe if you had uh, three cars that, uh, for some unlucky no reason, all three went out and you took them off yourself, um, you would stamp the VIN number from each car. So each catalytic converter would have a separate VIN number, but we could run the registration, see that that catalytic converter was taken off of that car. So if it, you could, in, in theory, have three catalytic converters in your possession, three separate VIN numbers that all match to your vehicle. So I, I, I believe that's in the bill under uh, the permanently etched so that you could etch it in there, uh, just, you know, something um, heat stamped or something of that, of that uh, nature. Yeah, thank you for that. So, I mean, I know that it's available as an option, but before this hearing, I didn't know that that was an option. So I don't expect an average person who maybe was taking three catalytic converters off and they want to replace them would first thing they do is go and get them stamped so that they don't face a felony. I don't know if that might be quite into the public's consciousness yet. Um, but I mean, of course, it, it would probably be a good idea so that you don't get busted or suspected of, of theft. It's just, I'm, I'm a bit concerned that's not going to be people's natural behavior. Certainly, and Chris Reese for the record, the, the circumstance that you're describing of taking your own catalytic converter off is so rare. Uh, probably more rare than these metals are that are, uh, you know, getting so much money um, at the scrapyards. Madam Vice Chair, again, Warren Hardy. And uh, most of these catalytic converters are, are, are marked with identification numbers, usually a part number of some kind, that can be traced back to the vehicle type. So it's not specific to the vehicle, I mean, to the, to the car, but at least you, as part of the presum uh, rebuttable presumption, you can show, yes, this was from a, a 95 Toyota Tercel and establish that. And Senator Wynn, do you see this type of presumption happening after you've been arrested? Right? Because I don't, I don't see um, an officer pulling someone over, you have three catalytic converters, and then you and the officer standing there going, okay, well, what's the serial number on this one? Okay, I see it. These go to Ford Tauruses. Okay, you are in fact registered to a Ford Taurus. Let's handle the other two, right? I, I'm assuming you're probably going to be arrested first and then have to, whenever you get into court, be prepared to show that the serial number matches the model and make of a car that you do in fact own and hope that that's enough to rebut the presumption. Rochelle Wynn, for the record, part of my thinking in like developing this idea of a rebuttable presumption comes from existing statute, and it comes from possession of identifying information of another. So if I have one um, identifying information, let's say I'm carrying around your license, um, that isn't a felony just by having one ID of another. What the state or what the state would have to prove is that um, I had intention to use your identification under like felonious like means or, you know, intent. 
If I have your ID and I have Ira Hansen's ID, there's already a rebuttable presumption that I don't have permission. And so that is a felony possession of uh, identifying information of another. And the state does not have to bring both you and Ira into um into court to prove that I had like ill intent. In fact, I would be arrested on that felony charge. And then I would talk to my defense attorney and say, oh no, those two individuals gave me permission to have their IDs. And then I would have to bring those two individuals in to prove that I didn't. But that is something that I trust our law enforcement partners are actually doing their investigation before they arrest. If they arrest someone and or they pull them over and they have multiple identifications in their car, their like possession, and it turns out it's like, oh, that's my father and that's my father-in-law, and they both live with me, and I'm going to make copies of their ID for their like passports applications, you know. And I do that, and as a part of their investig investigation and their questioning of me, when they see that, that is enough that they believe that I haven't committed a crime they don't have to arrest me but if they don't buy that story and they want to arrest me then I would have to go through the judicial process so um, giving everyone a tutorial on like possession of ID theft um, you know that was kind of our same thinking here and that was my thinking on here is this is a similar situation but it's even less so because you don't even have a name you don't have a way to identify that like catalytic converter to that vehicle and so people are able to have shopping carts full of catalytic converters as they walk down and steal in 90 seconds you know catalytic converters down a parking lot um, you see a lot of that theft in parking lots, um, and it, it is true. The the vehicles, the people that are being victimized the most are the people that can, you know, not lose their car the most, and it means the most. It means they don't have a vehicle. They don't have a way to go to child care. They don't have a way to get to their job um, because their 1995 Toyota Corolla is out of commission. So um, that's kind of the thinking behind it. Is there any way to actually trace back where a catalytic converter came from? Chris Reese, for the record, I don't believe so. So if you had a catalytic converter taken off of a car, unless, unless you could put the, the used catalytic converter back underneath of your vehicle, and the cut marks line up perfectly, but but again, I, I I don't know that it would be that easy of a yeah. So there's something that just that makes me a little bit nervous about, um, you know, in the same way that it's difficult to prove the crime, it's equally difficult to prove you didn't commit it because you can't actually say which car that it came from, and in fact we usually put it on the government to prove that the crime was in fact committed, not on the person to prove that they didn't commit a crime, right? Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that we can find some way to make this a bit more narrowly tailored um, so that we're not shifting how we prosecute crimes um, although I know this is a very real problem that we absolutely must address. Rochelle Wynn, for the record, and I think that's why I brought up the possession of identifying information of another. While it is not a typical that you have that rebuttable presumption, we do have that in existing law. And it is in situations like this, and based on my now 21 years I'm practicing mostly predominantly criminal defense, um, believe me, it is not something that I haven't thought of other, uh, like tried to think of other ways in order to combat this. And that's why I think there is like this balance that I've tried to like walk in there to make sure that there is like enough opportunity to have a defense in that like innocent thing. But you know, I'm probably not as extreme as Mr. Hardy, but um, you know, there are very just very limited circumstances and to we would be going to the extremes to say that you were going to cut off all the catalytic converters on your vehicles um, and you wouldn't have a way to do that if you were 
in that kind of desperate situation where you had three cars and you were cutting off three catalytic converters, you'd probably have to find a place to sell them. And you would have to contact that place to find out how you would need to do that. And at least with these protections, they would say, hey, we need to know what car it came off with, so bring the vehicle registration or bring the information so we know where it came from, if you have the title to the car, all of those kind of things. Um, and quite honestly, if you cut off the catalytic converter to your car, your car is probably not inoperable, so you might have to, you know, you wouldn't have a car anyway. <laughs> yeah, and I, I guess I, part of the thing is I don't think most people would be cutting it off, which is why I started with, well, is there some room for like you have a catalytic converter and it's intact and you have two or three? Maybe we don't presume you've committed a felony. I don't know. Chris Reese, for the record, I believe that we would take that into consideration as well. You know, a totality of the circumstance where if you have a, a, a pristine catalytic converter, um, you know, and, and you have the, the vehicle title and you just forgot to, to mark the, the catalytic converter with the VIN number, um, you know, again, I mean, our, our law enforcement, we can, um, I'm happy to say that we, we can trust them that, that if that's the case, that we wouldn't be taking you to jail for a felony and more likely do a report. Um, I would also mention that the, you know, the, the bill says that the permanently marked, I'm not sure that it doesn't mean just a permanent marker. So that if you had, uh, you know, if you took your catalytic converter off and you didn't have an etch, um, you could take a permanent marker and write your VIN number on it. Um, but again, the, the, that circumstance is, I, I've never seen it. Um, I, I haven't heard any, any of our other detectives that have seen it. So um, if that's the case, again, the totality of the circumstances would um, kind of remedy your, um, um, your, your concerns. And Rochelle Wynn, for the record, I think part of my concern is there was you know, we did consider other numbers for the possession charge, um, and that is why it is at two. So you have to have two used, cut off, removed professional, or removed, you know, expertly, two catalytic converters, not just one. You can't just be, if you're walking down the street and you have a backpack, and you, even if you stole the used catalytic converter, that is not a felony still even under this law. So um, you do have to have that minimum of two to hit that threshold. The only time one comes into effect is if you're caught actually stealing it. And honestly, that's a theft charge anyway. <laughs> if you're caught in the act of stealing it, that's already covered by current existing felony statutes. Are you aware, so you, you brought up the um, the example of personal, personally identifiable information. Are you aware of any other time where we criminalize the possession of something that is otherwise legal? Chris Reese, for the record, possession of stolen vehicle would be a great example. That you can't prove that the person stole the vehicle, but they would otherwise have known that that vehicle was stolen. But in that example, the vehicle has to be reported stolen. And you can say that this vehicle was stolen and you are now in possession of it. I think the difference here is a catalytic converter. You don't know if that catalytic converter has been stolen or not. We're going to presume that it is. Rochelle Wynn, for the record, um, possess, it's no, known or should have known. So if you are in a vehicle, um, you can know it's stolen. So if you get up and you're like, I knew this vehicle was stolen, you tell the police officer, they're like, is this your car? And you're like, no, I stole it. You know, you're in possession of a stolen vehicle or I, you know, you know, Senator Hansen stole this vehicle and gave it to me. Um, that would be an example of being in possession of a stolen vehicle, and that is a felony. But also knew or should have known what the vehicle was stolen. So if someone gives you a vehicle and maybe the window's busted out, um, there are other circumstances that show that you should have known that vehicle was stolen. So it's not exactly the same as a rebuttable, but there are circumstances that our law enforcement officers and prosecutors use to determine whether or not that person should have known that vehicle was stolen when they don't confess. Right. I guess my, the distinction I'm trying to draw here is that law enforcement knows the vehicle is stolen, Right. Here, law enforcement would not know whether the catal catalytic converter was stolen or not, right? So, I mean, it's almost like I'm walking down the street with a shopping cart full of shoes. 
And yes, I have a whole bunch of shoes. Nobody knows where they came from, but none of the shoes have been reported stolen in particular, right? It, are there other examples where we criminalize the possession of something that is just otherwise legal to have? It's never legal to have a stolen vehicle. I'm talking items, right? I could walk down the street with um, uh, as many water bottles in a shopping cart as I'd like, or you know, a, a number of other things. There's nothing illegal about owning a large amount or possessing a large amount of something that isn't otherwise illegal. Or are there other examples? Uh, Chris Reese, again, uh, for the record, uh, credit cards as well. So if you had two or more of credit cards in somebody else's name and numbers, then it would be presumed that those were stolen. Again, totality of the circumstances, you know, uh, you, you give your kid your, um, your wallet to go purchase gro groceries, they may have two of your credit cards in there. But again, the, the officer would make that investigation. Um, but yeah, the, the, the possession of credit card without owner's consent. Any physical items, like things you can buy or like things that are bought and sold on the market? You know, so credit cards aren't bought and sold. IDs aren't bought and sold on the market. Are there any examples of where it's illegal to possess anything you could just buy and sell Otherwise, uh, Rochelle Wynn, I, I, I'm not familiar. There are some um, prosecutors that are probably here in the room. They might be able to testify if there are any other crimes that they're aware of. We'll get to that if there's ever an answer. I'd love to I'd love to know so that I know that we're not that this isn't different. Right. Um, OK, Senator Hansen, I believe you had another question, sir. Actually, first, a comment. I mean, we do know that the vice chair is part of the green energy revolution, so I'm certain all three of our automobiles are electric, and electric do not have catalytic converters. Right? <laughs> Actually, my comment was, Mike, look, if you, there is one, and I saw you, we were thinking on the same page. It is very easy to take two nuts off of the uh, exhaust manifold to drop the entire muffler assembly, and that's where I think the vice chair is going. And I think that is something you need to address in the bill, because you could very easily take off, I've seen it many times, that's why it, register my head and I've seen them at junkyards and stuff do piles of the complete muffler assembly including the catalytic converters so the idea that we always chop them off that's probably a very much a red flag for law enforcement but if somebody has taken the complete thing it does take a little bit longer but it's not not you know having done my fair share of mechanical stuff I know in five ten minutes you can pull off the entire assembly which would include the catalytic converter. So you guys might want to, in the bill, come up with something so that that's not a crime now for me to show up at the scrapyard with maybe two of those off a couple of vehicles or something that were literally taken from the exhaust manifold back. Rochelle Wynn, for the record, um, I'm definitely open to tightening up the language as necessary um, and, you know, further defining some of those things to make sure we're capturing the right people. Perfect. Thanks, Madam Vice Chair. Okay, last question, I promise. Is there anything to protect the folks who kind of repair cars in their front yard? Maybe they're not a, a licensed repair shop, but, you know, all their friends come there. You know, they don't live in an HOA, so they've got, you know, 10 cars in their front yard and in the back that they're working on over time. They also may occasionally be in possession of two or more, but they're not going to fit under these rebuttable presumptions here because let's say they don't necessarily own the car that they're working on they aren't actually a licensed uh you know auto repair shop is there anything to protect these you know kind of neighborhood folks rochelle win for the record you know um I'm glad that you're bringing this to our attention. That was one of the concerns I had. I was hopeful that Section E of that would kind of include that, but I can see how it doesn't include all of those people that, you know, might be, you know, the home the home guy tinkerer <laughs> um, or girl, um, you know, so I, I'm opening to, oh, I'm open to making sure that we're, you know, the hobby guy or the person who's hoarding vehicles on their vehicle, on their their lot in their non-HOA. So um, I, I definitely um, am open to coming up with language that more maybe more broadly like encompasses people like that. Thank you. Other questions from members before we move on to testimony? Okay. Thank you, Senator. Uh, if there is anyone here in Carson City who'd like to come and testify in support of Senate Bill 243, 
go ahead and fill the seats. Senator Hardy, whenever you're ready, sir. Thank you, Madam Chair. Now can I go? Yeah, thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, for the record, uh, Warren Hardy representing uh, Nevada Pick Apart, uh, uh, SA Recycling, and the Urban Consortium, which is made up of the cities of Las Vegas, Henderson, North Las Vegas, Reno, and Sparks. This is a major issue for our local governments, and, and we're grappling with them. And, and several of our cities are looking at, have already adopted, North Las Vegas has already adopted an ordinance on this. So this kind of direction coming from the from the state level is going to be very important. And I will say, uh, Madam Vice Chair, that the scenario you brought up at the very end of the hearing itself is the most likely scenario where you do have somebody that's helping a neighbor out. That's, and, and so there are ways to deal with that, including them taking a Sharpie and, and saying this belongs to this vehicle. Uh, so the, the, the scenario you brought up is very, very important. But, but I would submit uh, for the committee's uh, consideration that the real folks we're trying to protect here is the single mom or dad that comes out at 6.30 to get to their job, and now they've got a, a $2,500 to $6,000 issue to repair on their job before they can drive, or on their vehicle before they can drive that. And I have worked with uh, Senator Wynn. I've worked on this issue for a lot of years. This is the best attempt I've ever seen at getting at all of those issues. And so my clients are all very much in support of this and really appreciate her t the time that she's taken. This has not been something she threw together at the last minute. We've been talking about this for a couple of years. And so I want to thank her for the tremendous effort on this and you, Madam Vice Chairman, for your thoughtful questions as well. And we look forward to working with you. Good afternoon, Vice Chair Harris, members of the committee. Uh, for the record, my name is Nick Schneider, policy analyst for the Vegas Chamber. Uh, we'd like to thank the bill sponsor for bringing this bill forward. We're in support of SB 243 as it aids in monitoring and closing the distribution channels of stolen catalytic converters. Uh, this is a rising concern for citizens and businesses alike. It's an inconvenience that's both expensive and tedious as far as sourcing replacement parts, and it's bad for the environment. Uh, we believe that the combination of registering and listing and logging those who sell used ca uh, catalytic converters, uh, which will help create that paper trail, uh, and allowing for prosecution of those in possession, uh, will help in limiting the spread of this type of crime. Thank you for your time. Good afternoon, Vice Chair and members of the committee. My name is Candace Townsend and I represent the City of North Las Vegas. We are here today in strong support of SB 243. The theft of catalytic converters has been a serious issue affecting our residents. And for this reason, our council passed Ordinance 3160 in February of this year to combat the rising crime and help protect our citizens. We believe SB 243 is a solution to a crime that has victimized our community. We appreciate the many legislators who have signed on as sponsors to this bill. Thank you to Senator Wynn for bringing this important issue forward, and we are glad to strongly support SB 43. Thank you. 243. <laughs> Madam uh, Vice Chair, members of the committee, Alfredo Alonzo today with the uh, Automobile Alliance, and uh, we strongly support this bill. It's, it's in fact, one of the, the better bills we've seen across the country. Uh, one of the things that's really difficult to, to, to get your arms around with this particular issue is there's about 158 uh, today catalytic converter manufacturers. So the idea of ever being able to, being able to get a, a VIN number that matches the engine is very, very difficult, obviously. The other issue that makes it difficult is you've got both direct fit, which are manufactured solely for that particular vehicle, or you have universal fit, which could really fit on a certain type of vehicle or a certain brand. And so the, the, the biggest issue, obviously, everyone has is how do you uh, get at these, these uh, uh, these problems because they become a, a, a massive issue obviously with our dealers uh, the parts don't exist and I can tell you personally this happened to my daughter a couple of days ago she had her car stolen about two weeks ago finally got it back it was basically stripped and they took the catalytic converter and what we've seen is a huge number of it's a huge increase in auto thefts and about at about 900,000 over 20 uh, and, and so what's happened is obviously that's COVID, so there's, you have to account for that, but it's still a massive number. And what, what some thieves have done is they've simply stolen the vehicles and taken anything of value very quickly and then dumped them. 
and that happened to my kid. So uh, I, I know it. I know it's a problem, and I know that it's a difficult problem to get your arms around. But I think this bill does again uh, uh, a very admirable job of getting there, and uh, we would strongly support. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair Harris, members of the Senate Judiciary Committee. My name is John Jones, and I'm here on behalf of the Nevada District Attorneys Association in support of the bill. I want to thank Senator Wynn for bringing us into this discussion uh, during the interim. Um, and, and I do want to answer a, a few questions. Uh, Vice Chair Wynn, you, you, there was a lot of discussion uh, about the amendment and there being a rebuttable presumption. I, I want to make clear that the rebuttable presumption language has come out of the bill when you look at our amendment. So them the person not being a, an automobile wrecker, scrap metal processor, a manufacturer, is an element of the offense that we would have to prove as an officer at the level of a probable cause and as a DA by a beyond a reasonable doubt standard. So in other words, if Detective Reese arrests somebody for possessing three catalytic converters and the declaration of arrest stops there, that's a denial from my office because the second half of the new crime has not been met. In other words, that they're not a, a licensed dealer of some sort. And we can prove that several different ways. An officer can run uh, their name in a business licensing database. There's no licenses there. Or sometimes post Miranda, the defendant will just say, you know, I don't do this for a living, this is stolen, in which case that makes it easy. So this is not a rebuttable presumption bill. We would have to prove that they're not a wrecker, a processor, a manufacturer, et cetera. Quick question and then I will let you go. So am I understanding you correctly that if three of my friends, although I understand this might be a bit far-fetched, but if three of my friends gave me their catalytic converters, I'm caught in possession of it, that's a felony, and I have no out. John Jones, on behalf of the Nevada District Attorneys Association, assuming you're not listed in any of the databases and uh, you state that you're not a vehicle processor, then under that scenario, potentially, you could face. Now, if you start telling um, the detective or officers, look, I got these from my three friends and they'll vouch for you, then obviously we're not going to have a prosecutable case there. Why not? I'm not the lawful owner of the catalytic converters, so John I've met the second prong and I'm in possession. John Jones, on behalf of the Nevada District Attorneys Association, if you were given three catalytic converters from people who were the actual owners and they're willing to testify to that fact, you are the legal owner. Okay. I would suggest that sometimes people give things, people things, and they're not, I mean, you're in possession of it, but I don't own it, right? What if I'm going to give it back to them? They're giving it to me because they want me to repair their car. I don't then own that catalytic converter or own the vehicle, right? I'm just in possession of it with the owner's permission. And there's nothing in here for, for that scenario is what I'm suggesting. John Jones, on behalf of the Nevada District Attorneys Association, I, I thought you meant gift as in legal conveyance. But if you're even talking about a temporary conveyance, I think the same argument still applies. You're still a legal possessor at that point because you were given uh, them by the rightful owner. Okay. I would suggest the bill is drafted does not cover that scenario. And if that's your intention, then there might be just a small little amendment for being in legal possession as opposed to just being the legal owner. All right. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Vice Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Amanda Brazo, and I'm here on behalf of Boyd Gaming. Boyd Gaming supports Senate Bill 243 because we believe it's good policy protect to protect residents and tourists. And we want to thank the sponsor of the bill for bringing this forward. Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee, Sasha Stevenson for the record. I'm here for MGM Resorts. Um, the Las Vegas Strip has not been immune from the uptick in this criminal activity, and we uh, thank the sponsor for the intent behind the bill and support the measure as it is finally drafted to address the issues that have been raised. Hello, uh, hello, Chair uh, Harris. This is Vincent Guthrie. I serve as the Executive Director for NACO, the Nevada Association of Counties. Um, we're also in support of this bill. We want to thank the sponsor for engaging um, our members during the, the interim and um, helping to craft this um, and trying to get a handle on this community-wide problem. Um, you've heard from our sheriffs about um, some of the issues that they've seen in the community, and we really appreciate um, her introduction to this bill and, again, strongly support. Thank you. 
Good afternoon, Madam, Vi afternoon, Madam Vice Chair, uh, members of the committee, for the record, Andrew McCam, the Executive Director of the Nevada Franchise Auto Dealers Association. Uh, not to belabor uh, this hearing, but a couple points that I do want to uh, put on the record. As alluded to uh, previously by uh, Mr. Alonzo and Mr. Hardy, um, I personally, I, I think this is hands down arguably one of the best proposals to tackle this, this problem. And this is a serious problem, as everybody is aware of. Uh, we are strong supporters at um, the national level uh, of legislation, the PART Act, which is currently being uh, sponsored by Senator Klobuchar and uh, Congressman uh, Baird. Between 2019 and 2022, that was a 1,215 percent increase in catalytic converter thefts. Uh, Mr. Stone, uh, you took some of my thunder away. I was going to go through some of the, uh, the metals in terms of what does that ultimately cost. Um, average repair in these is five to six thousand dollars. Somewhere is an upwards of ten thousand dollars. Now to kind of bring things locally, um, one dealership in Las Vegas alone in last year uh, did forty thousand dollars in repairs of stolen catalytic converters from customers that uh, that patronize that business. The dealership itself suffered twenty seven thousand dollars in catalytic converter losses. Um, that is separate and apart from $20,000 in property damage uh, that the dealership uh, suffered because the thieves cut down uh, the fencing, broke the gates, et cetera, et cetera. This is a serious, serious problem. If an individual ultimately has his or her catalytic converter stolen from their vehicle, the vehicle is in fact operational. But ultimately, where the rubber meets the road and becomes seriously problematic is, is it will never pass an emissions test. So therefore, he or she will never be able to re-register their vehicle and will never be able to use that car lawfully uh, within uh, the state of Nevada. And I would actually say you can't even use it uh, anywhere in the country because, uh, well, depending on the year of the vehicle, um, any vehicle that is made with a catalytic converter, you have to keep it on. That's federal law. Um, so in closing, we, we enthusiastically support this bill. I understand that there's perhaps some changes coming. Uh, but the intent is good, and, and we think Senator Wayne for it. Appreciate your time. Well, this chair went down. I'm barely see over the counter here, but <clears throat> thank you, Madam Vice Chair, Committee. For the record, my name is Terry Graves. I'm here today representing the Nevada Trucking Association as well as two scrap metal recyclers. First of all, on behalf of the Trucking Association, it is an issue with them. Uh, large diesel trucks are not such an issue as the catalytic converters for them are not as valuable as what are used on gasoline cars. However, for a lot of trucking companies, they have medium and light duty vehicles that do have catalytic converters, and this can be a problem for them. I also represent two scrap metal dealers, Engine Quest in North Las Vegas and Western Metals Recycling in Sparks, Nevada. They do not do a lot of business with catalytic converters, but to the extent that they do, I might try to answer to some degree uh, Senator Dondera Loop's uh, question earlier. Uh, Warren Hardy and myself were very involved in the original copper theft legislation some sessions ago. And part of what came out of that was that we set up a communications network with Metro or the local uh, police affiliates in Reno. And if a major theft occurred, and in those days the thefts were usually from infrastructure people taking cobble, copper cables out of streetlight systems, or I think there was a case in Reno where an entire bleachers, aluminum bleachers section was stolen out of a high school football field. But anyway, the point is that in a lot of cases, you could associate the stolen property with a crime scene. And that helped in the prosecution of the criminals. And the point I'd like to make is that you find out, and I hope Metro would back me up on this, that there's not a lot of people committing these crimes. And if you catch a few of them all at once, the problem is very much minimized or eliminated. Now, I'm not sure that that's going to be true with a 
with the uh, converter, catalytic converter issue because it's a simpler thing to do and there are probably more people doing it. But if you can catch a few of these people, it really cuts in to the problem. Um, another point I'd like to make, I'm being told by my client that you cannot resell a catalytic converter. The only place they can take a catalytic converter to is a reprocessor or a refiner. And what happens there is they cut the catalytic converter open, remove the contents, and reclaim the valuable rare earth minerals that are in there. And then those minerals are recycled back into new products. And with the issue of shortages, what is happening with the black market issue, so these things get collected, taken often out of the country. So I think it is a good approach to go after people that have these in their possession. And I understand your concerns, but I, I think that's a very small part of the problem. My, as Mr. Hardy stated, my clients would probably not buy a catalytic converter from somebody just walking in off the street. They either get them through a car that's been uh, demoed or from a legitimate auto repair shop that in the course of their business has to replace a catalytic converter. Um, the other couple issues I'd just like to mention, and, and Senator Gwen has said she will work with all of us. Um, record keeping, record keeping for this issue is a little different than scrap metal processes are used to. Um, we can work on that. And the anod, I just mentioned one, and I think. Um, McKay uh, just mentioned some of the values of these. Well, let me start over. One of the differences between the scrap metal law and this bill, in the scrap metal law, the, the crime is based on the value of the things that are stolen. And what we put into that law, not only was it the value of the copper or the metal that was taken, also, the value of the damage done, which was, could multiply the value and move it into a higher uh, conviction level. In this bill, it's all about possession of the, of the items, and that, that's a difference that, uh, just for the edification of the committee. And the other issue was checks. One, one of my clients does not do checks. They do either automatic transfers or give a ATM redeemable credit card for payment for scrap metal. So that may be another issue we need to work out. So with that, I thank the committee's time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vice Chair, members of the committee. For the record, Mike Cathcart representing the city of Henderson. Just want to thank the sponsor of the bill, Senator Wynn, for her leadership on this issue and, and meeting with us as stakeholders during the interim. Also want to thank the District, Attor District Attorneys Association for their work on the amendment. This was one of the priorities of the Henderson Police Department coming into the session, so we're glad to see this bill moving. Thank you. Good afternoon, Vice Chair, members of the committee. For the record, Mike Draper with Argentum Partners. I'm here today on behalf of the Morello Group and specifically the Grand Sierra Resort in Sahara, Las Vegas. Catalytic converter theft is, a, is an issue we spend a lot of time worrying about on our properties and also on behalf of our employees and our guests. So we very, very much appreciate the leadership that uh, Senator Wynn has shown in bringing this bill forward and we're very, very supportive of SB 243. Thank you. Good afternoon, Senator Harris, members of the committee, Jason Walker, Washington County Sheriff's Office. 
Senate Bill 243 testifying in support. This also was one of our priorities. We're happy to see that it's moving forward. This is a good bill for the right reasons. Thank you. Vice Chair Harris, members of the committee, my name is Arely Alarcón, and I'm here to testify in support of Senate Bill 243 on behalf of Copart. Thank you. Can you um, please just uh, spell your name for the record? Yes, so Arely Alarcón, first name is spelled A-R-E-L-I, last name A-L-A-R-C-O-N. Thank you. Vice Chair Harris, members of the committee, Nick, Vasili Nick Vasiliadis here for the record on behalf of NV Energy and in the sake of brevity, us too. Good afternoon, Vice Chair Harris, uh, members of the committee, Randy Brown on behalf of AT&T today. Uh, we're in support of Senate Bill 243. Um, as Senator Dondero Loop noted, back in the 75th session of the Nevada legislature, AT&T was part of the coalition that uh, updated these laws related to scrap metal processing. Um, AT&T operates a fleet of nearly 375 vehicles in the state of Nevada, and we are not immune from this situation. Um, in the past two years, approximately 20 catalytic converters have been stolen from vehicles in our gated and fenced lots. Um, thieves specifically target our bucket trucks, which are higher off the ground, allowing easier access to the catalytic converter. And these thefts occur because there's a ready market for the resale of these products. So. Um, we do appreciate Senator Wynn working with all interested parties, and we support this bill fully. Thank you. Misty Grimmer with the Ferraro Group representing Cox Communications. We also are in support of this bill, um, similar to all the concerns that, that Mr. Brown just said. Cox has the same issues, um, including that a lot of our technicians actually take our vehicles home at night so that they can respond quickly, so they don't even always have the protection of being behind a fence. So we are very much in support. Thank you. Okay, we will go down to Las Vegas. Anyone in Las Vegas looking to testify in support of Senate Bill 243? Go ahead and... Uh, yes, I'm uh, testifying yeah. for. Oh. My name is Al Rojas, spelled A-L, last name R-O-J-S. I reside in Assembly District 12, which is part of Senate District 21, and I frequent Senate District 2 and Senate District 10. Uh, first of all, I'm a uh, Republican, and I, uh, I congratulate the, the Democratic part of our Senate for introducing this bill because reducing crime in Nevada is going to have a profound effect on every aspect, including education, diversifying our economy, and reducing our taxes because um, uh, <clears throat> companies are going to want to come to Nevada. And this is, this is one of the um, bills that is very critical to us. I have actually met more people that have had their catalytic converters stolen than have died from COVID, and COVID is seri was a serious uh, issue. Now, um, I also have a background in a little bit in auto repair, um, uh, and um, I had, uh, Senator Harris's um, uh, concerns, questions were, were very legitimate in many ways. I understand that you know we don't want to arrest uh, law-abiding citizens or people who you know, can accidentally get arrested. Um, one of the recommendations that I have is that if you do saw off your uh, catalytic converter, that you take a picture so that you have uh, some evidence to uh, defend yourself if you're interrogated by the police or if you're arrested. Regarding her question, if somebody's doing automotive repair in their, in their neighborhood, you can do an invoice just like when you go to an automotive repair and you sign an estimate, it says that you're authorizing the, uh, <clears throat> the person who's doing your repairs, the, the service shop, to have possession of your vehicle and that anything in the vehicle is supposedly yours. So there are uh, methods to protect that that can be added to the, claw, to the, uh, to the bill. But I do uh, want to say that um, our guiding light should be that as legislative branch, because we live by your rules here in the state of Nevada, is that we should be pr protecting the law-abiding citizens and the law enforcement community because the definition of a safe community is where law-abiding citizens and law enforcement have the upper hand over crime. And yes, I totally agree that we don't want to be arresting people who um, uh, mistakenly get, um, uh, can, can mistakenly be arrested, but I think there's many, many, um, uh, ways to protect that and you know the DA does have the last voice and I also wanted to add with all that 
is that instead of being two or more, I honestly think it should be one or more. As long as you can prove that um, uh, with those, some of those things that I mentioned, I think it would be easy to prove that you own that catalytic converter um, uh, and with, in addition with the, the picture and the invoicing and um, uh, all the other provisions that Senator Nguyen uh, put in her bill. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Madam Chairwoman, members of the committee. My name is Virginia Valentine. I'm with the Nevada Resort Association. Ms. Valentine, if you could please thinking. bring the mic just a little bit closer to you. We're having some trouble hearing you here in Carson City. Thank you. I'll, can you hear me now? Much better. Great. I will uh, start over. My name is Virginia Valentine. I'm with the Nevada Resort Association, and I will start by thanking the, the sponsor, Senator Wynn, and um, all the sponsors on the bill. This is a very important bill to us. I think many of you know that one of our top focuses this session is tourism um, safety. The theft of these items can, occurs across parking garages, surface lots. Probably the resorts operate more surface lots and garages and parking spaces in total than maybe any other industry in the state. When a theft occurs on property, this creates a problem because the car is generally rendered use, uh, in usable or inoperable. That means the car has the vehicle has to be towed. If that happens to a guest on the property and they drove, they drove to Las Vegas, then likely they're going to have very much trouble getting home. This also happens to our employees and our employee parking garages. Um, so sometimes too, there's a concern that the suspects who come onto the property with the intent of Ceiling catalytic converters might be there to create some other mischief. So in short, this is a, we think this is a great bill. We fully support it. It's good for the guests, it's good for the employees, and we, we appreciate and ask your support. Thank you. David Gomez, Nevada Peace Alliance president, also a lobbyist for the state and also the federal, former president of Wake Up with Marzette Lewis. Um, I live on the east side of Las Vegas, and a lot of you guys don't really know too much about that area, Senate District 2. I'm also a nominee for Senator um, against Edgar Flores, which is a good friend of mine. But nevertheless, you know, I sent all of you guys pictures in your email. You should have just received it, and it says this is the pictures of the basket full of Cali converters, that nobody was able to stop them. I send it to you guys, and I just want to thank uh, Senator Wynn for bringing this up, because I am a victim of this issue. Now, what happened was <clears throat> my diesel truck has a diesel particulate filter on it, as well as a cat. And they actually cut the whole thing off. And it cost me about $5,600. Nobody's rebating me that. I'm not going to file an insurance claim because it's not worth it. It wasn't worth it at all. So what I did was I went ahead and paid for it out of my pocket, having seven children in this state taking care of each and every one of them, and also being a husband and a business owner and a lot of other things, a nonprofit organization representative. You know, you talk about <clears throat> some of the issues with people being arrested unjustfully. Well, obviously, we need to have a tag system. So obviously, people need to, you need to make up something where people can call in or go online, log it in, and say, hey, my name is this, my information is this, and I'm taking this Cadillac converter off of this thing, which goes to the Metro Police Department. So if they get caught with it, they'll say, hey, let me check it out real quick. Let me look at this. Oh, yeah, you did report that you did take this off of your vehicle, and you did put the VIN number inside the system where it actually tags to us, and we understand that this is a mistake. Go ahead, have a nice day, and go do what you need to do. But then again, we're talking about businesses as well that take Cadillac converters. Those businesses, I know a lot of different businesses that are shady in this state. And what if they got a friend or somebody that supports them or somebody that says, hey, you know, what? I'm going to bring you a bunch of cats. You know, I can't justify anything and we're just going to go ahead and just shoot them through the system. And they just go ahead and take them. And they say, no, they're justifiable. You know, then you guys were talking about removing cats, you know, um, by bolts. Do you know how much pressure you have to put onto an exhaust manifold to keep that sound from coming out of your truck or car? That sounds like my truck driving on an everyday basis, a diesel truck. You got to apply a lot of pressure to those bolts to get them off. So if somebody can reach their hand up in that area and remove those bolts, godly, they are really good at what they do. But most thieves obviously don't do that. They just go ahead and cut them off. Now, the pictures I sent you were the pictures I gave to Metro Police Department. I sent them to the former sheriff, which was Joe Lombardo, and the captain of downtown center, or downtown command center, which is um, the former captain, which was Centron. 
And they're the ones that stopped these people. When I saw them walking across the street with two baskets full of cats, that was ridiculous. I've never seen anything like that. So when I confronted the man, he looked at me and he told me to mind my, you know, a bunch of profane words, business. And I said, no, I'm not going to mind my business. You know why? Because I'm tired of this happening. I'm tired of being a victim of these circumstances and that lawmakers are going around saying, well, we don't want to put nobody in jail unlawfully. Well, you know what? There's ways to justify how you got this cat. Now, I had a car that I recycled. It was a Lexus. I gave the Lexus cat to, uh, I had a brand new one I was going to put on there because it wouldn't pass smog. So sir, I said, I got to buy a new one. Sir, we've, I ended up we've given it a lot, to my neighbor. We've given lots of leeway for testimony today, which means I run out of leeway at the end. So if you I could. I know I'm the black skin that nobody likes to talk to, but that's okay. I no, have a nice day. Thank you. No, no, no. And if you please have additional information, please feel free to submit it to the committee. We appreciate you. And I enjoyed listening I to you. I already gave you guys the emails, ma'am. All right. Thank you so and you much. you guys should have received it because I received your, your response. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Appreciate you being here. Anyone else want to testify in support of Senate Bill 243? Okay. Can we check the phone lines broadcast, please? See if there's anyone on the phone who'd like to testify in support. If you would like to testify in support of SB 243, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Good afternoon, Vice Chair Harrison, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Pamela Del Porto, Executive Director for Nevada Sheriffs and Chiefs Association. We are testifying in support today of Senate Bill 243. We thank Senator Wynn and all of the stakeholders on the, for the work that they have done on this very important bill. Thank you so much. Chair, you have no more callers at this time. All right, we'll go ahead and turn to testimony in opposition. Anyone here in Carson City who wants to testify in opposition to Senate Bill 243? Okay, anyone in Las Vegas want to testify in opposition? All right, let's go ahead and check the phones, please. Anyone on the phone who'd like to testify in opposition to Senate Bill 243? Your public line has been working, but you have no callers at this time. Great, thank you. We'll move on to the neutral position. Anyone here in Carson City want to testify in neutral? Okay, seeing none, a uh, quick visual check in Las Vegas. Uh, suggest there's no one to testify neutral either, and I have a good guess as to what you're going to say, but let's check the phone lines anyway. Anybody on the phone want to testify in the neutral position? Chair, you have no callers this time. All right. With that, we'll go ahead and close out the hearing on Senate Bill 243 and move on to the last item on our agenda, which is public comment. Anyone here in Las Vegas want to give public comment? Oh, I'm sorry, here in Carson City. Okay. I want to make some public comments. Uh, uh, how are you? Um, I Carson just. Oh, I'm sorry, Carson City. That's all right. We're, I was just about to come to Las Vegas. Um, so go ahead, sir. Go ahead and give your public comment. But please remember, it yeah, must not be is. about the bill that we just heard. So on That's any fine. other topic, we're That's happy okay. to hear you. Okay. My name is Al Rojas. Like I said, I live in Senate uh, District 21, and I frequent Senate District 2. Senate District 10, which is uh, low, uh, east side. Uh, which is high crime, and I want I want to commend um, uh, a lot of our uh, Democratic and Republican senators that we're trying to make uh, Nevada a better place to live. And I just want to say that, you know, uh, I wanted to talk about education, uh, diversifying our economy, uh, which are which are topics that are um, uh, <clears throat> very critical to Nevada. And I think the common denominator, and you you see it specifically here on the east side, which I recite. Now I own property in Henderson, and I, um, I spent my whole adult life in Irvine, California, which was a planned community. Many of the problems that are happening here in Nevada, they can easily be addressed, like education, uh, diversifying our economy, um, uh, <clears throat> and uh, reducing crime. Uh, we kept on top of those things, but however, I grew up in Los Angeles, and I've seen their failed policies. I graduated from high school in 1978, lived in Irvine for maybe about 35 years, and been a resident here for six years, 
And in 78, I decided to run out of L.A. and go to the uh, suburbs, like most, like some conservatives. But this time, I'm not going to run. I'm going to stay and help with everything that I learned in Irvine. And I can tell you that the biggest problem that we have is we have to reduce crime. We have to reduce homelessness. Our, the reason why you guys can throw a trillion dollars, you guys are throwing $3 billion into education, which is fine, but I don't think it's going to solve the problem. The problem is that we got to reduce crime and reducing homelessness, making people accountable if they're, if, if they're having crime in the schools, reducing, there's a bill for that too, to uh, reduce the crime in uh, school, because nobody's going to want to live in a community that has high crime. You're going to lose businesses, which is going to lose tax revenue, which is going to make us pay more taxes. You're going to lose teachers, because nobody's going to want to be in a, in a place where they have the possibility of a, two, of a student acting up and they get a felony. Nobody wants a felony. Who, who knows what the, the consequences are of a felony? Nobody wants to lose their property taxes. Nobody wants to live in a community where the, there's high crime and there's low education. If you look at Clark County School District, from what I'm hearing, there's less vacancies for uh, teachers in Henderson than there is in, in, um, uh, in, uh, in, Clark, in, La, in Las Vegas, in North Las Vegas. That's because of the crime. So if we reduce the crime, we're going to have more businesses come to Nevada, which was what we did in Irvine. We're going to have better teachers. We're going to diversify our, our economy. We're going to pay less taxes. And I think that our method should be what every bill that we're doing, can it reduce crime? Can we reduce crime in schools? Can we do reduce crimes in our community? Can we reduce homelessness? We can't make it so that it, we are more people come to um, uh, be just be homeless because they're looking on how to be predators and how to prey off of people who who are working and a lot of them don't even want help. They just want to be on the streets, seeing what they can uh, steal or pilfer or or panhandle. And we are creating our own enemy. We are being our own enemies by letting crime go flourish. We are the capital, um, uh, entertainment capital of the world, and we are going to be the host of the. Um, uh, Super Bowl next year, and our police force is 30% understaffed. So crime is the common denominator. I think if we work on that bipartisan-wise, I think we're going to solve a lot of our problems, and we're going to be closer to those cities that everybody wants to go to, to start a new career, to start a family, to start a future, like I was looking for when I was, when I was 17 years old, to pursue my college education. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Yes, thank you, sir. Um, is there anyone on the phone lines who'd like to give public comment at this time? Chair, your public line is open and working, but you have no callers at this time. All right. Thank you so much. With that, ladies and gentlemen, we are adjourned. Everybody have a great day.